Good evening. I'm David Uwe, Executive Director at the Chinese American Museum, D.C., uh, the first and only museum in our nation's capital dedicated to the Chinese American story. Uh, this program is made possible through the generous support of AARP Maryland. And tonight we are here to talk about a pandemic, a pandemic amidst fear, racism, injustice, ignorance, anti-Chinese hate and violence, and shrewd political playbooks. You might think we're talking about COVID-19. No, we are talking about the bubonic plague around San Francisco at the turn of the century. If you haven't had a chance to see plague at the Golden Gate yet, please do so soon. It is a fascinating documentary that draws uncanny parallels to our most recent plague. Tonight's discussion is with the film's director, Li Shen Yu. She's an award-winning director and film editor at Steeplechase Films. And she's known for her work in collaboration with director Rick Burns, including the primetime Emmy award-winning epic documentary series, New York, and the PBS documentary, The Chinese Exclusion Act. So our moderator, Ted Gong, is the executive director of the 1882 Foundation and president of the DC chapter of the Chinese American Citizens Alliance. Ted was a career diplomat in the Department of State, working primarily in immigration, that's right. Ted is also included in the Frederick Douglass 200, a list of 200 people, abolitionists, diplomats, writers, feminists, and more, who best embody the spirit and work of Frederick Douglass. And I love telling that about Ted. I love hearing you say that. <laughs> And Audrey Wu Clark is the author of The Asian American Avant-Garde, Universalist Aspirations in Modernist Literature and Art. She is an assistant professor of English at the US Naval Academy, which is right in my backyard near Annapolis, Maryland. So thank you all for being here and in person and online. So uh, Li Shen, let me, let me first say, you know, what a gift this film is uh, just in terms of the depth that you go into this story. You know, I've heard about the bubonic plague in San Francisco, but really even from the museum standpoint, it's just been a very cursory top level um, uh, description of it. So, you know, it really is amazing how this is so familiar to what's gone on in the last few years, um, you know, really play by play. So, I guess let me first ask, was it a surprise to you the further you got into this project, you know, just how similar it was? It's actually a subject that I did not know anything about. In fact, I was surprised to hear that to be on the plague, I mean, that's the most feared disease in our human history had come to the United States and that, you know, San Francisco's Chinatown. Uh, and the more I learned about it, 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 what is striking is how similar it is to what we are experiencing today. The, the denial, the deflection, the you know, finger pointing, fear mongering that took place. Uh, you know, it seems like anytime we're faced with an unknown fear, our instinct is to finger point. We need to latch onto someone or some community to say, okay, that's patient one, right. you know, patient zero rather, and, and just go from there. Um, so it, it just seemed like a story that needed to be told. I think as we learn about this history, it, it resonates and re it allows us to reflect um, on our past and our future and how we want our future to be. I guess Audrey and Ted, same question. And you, you always have an encyclopedic knowledge of Chinese American history, but what you know, was there what there's there a lot in this film that surprised you? Um, you know the one thing is uh, just like David, the idea of having this book so much to learn not only of the Chinese American history or the Chinese history, but the the details of the, the bubonic plague, I didn't know. <laughs> then yeah. uh, all the uh, 
the development of the national health uh, health uh, and uh, and uh, policies that uh, came about doing that. I think that was uh, just a uh, uh, fascinating, thoroughly fascinating because it really so much who are we doing today. But you know, one of the things that um, that is so happy to be here with Audrey is, is that she actually participated in another one of our 1882 foundation programs, which was related to smallpox epidemic in California during the, in effect, the Chinese. She is, of course, in literature, uh, but she has done a lot about stereotypes and how those stereotypes grew uh, against the Chinese and continue up today. So maybe you can relate a little bit about how those and that's one of the things that I found fascinating is that the quick identification of Chinese as patient zero, cordoning off that. And a lot of that maybe even have some precedence in the 1880s, smallpox. Yep. Yeah, so the smallpox epidemic occurred in four times in the late uh, 19th century. So in 1868, 1876, 1880, and 1887. Um, and in all those instances, but increasingly, Chinese Americans were blamed for the smallpox. Um, and it, like um, the current plague, the COVID-19 epidemic, or pandemic rather, um, it's, it was transferred through droplets in the air. And so people for a long time didn't know how, how it was transmitted. Um, but again, Chinese were to blame. And so during the second um, epidemic, Chinatown was quarantined. Um, and so it was a big shock to the Chinese American community. Um, and uh, really, at that time, only 60 um, Chinese Americans out of the 16,000 cases of small packs were, were existent. So really, there were just so few Chinese that actually had it that they were again blamed for it. Um, when I was doing the talk for the 1882 Foundation, Ted had asked me later about the bubonic plague and to see whether there was a kind of Donald Trumpian figure um, during the bubonic plague. But really what Li Xin's film um, kind of articulates is that um, there were a lot of politics involved in the bubonic plague, right? That um, there, at one point, um, the Surgeon General Wyman and Governor Gage were in cahoots to keep this a secret, right? And um, even Governor Gage wanted, he said that Kenyon was making it all up, right? That it was a conspiracy theory. And so people wanted to blame others or to kind of hush this disease so that it wouldn't affect the economy. Very, very much um, uh, so. I mean, a lot of similarity is, you know, the, the finger pointing, the, you know, the there was a huge amount of mistrust all around. Um, no trust, in fact, you know, the Chinese community with the authorities and with the health authorities. You know, this is a population of the community had were the adults all lived through the passage of the 1882 Act, which was you know 18 years ago, had had lived through the Geary Act a mere you know 10 years later in 1892, where Chinese yet again had the you know the uh, yet again the only people in the US that needed to carry a photo ID for fear of deportation. So there's all this pressure on the community and the Chinese Exclusion Act was about to be renewed a mere two years later. Chinatown was where Chinese, the only place Chinese could live uh, because of regulations that prevented them from living anywhere else. And Chinatown landlords were mostly slum lords, you know, white slumlords who did not upkeep sanitation codes, charged exorbitant rate. So the Chinese community was really under a lot of pressure for, it, for you know, trusting the federal doctors who came in. Of course, the play, its transmission vector was not well understood at the time. This was, fairly early on in germ theory, that something unseen 
could cause damage to the body was not fully understood by a lot of pra practicing physicians. So the knowledge was that, you know, it's a Chinese disease. So we will only look in Chinatown. And in fact, I think historians now believe the numbers are actually much higher, you know, uh, because cases outside of Chinatown probably were not discovered or were not diagnosed, you know, because the symptoms could be like pneumonia or uh, other diseases. And so the, the, the community was really um, just under a lot of pressure, but, you know, with, with the very heavy handed, you know, quarantining after the first case, the quarantine entire to block district rather than identifying, well, where did this take place? You know, trying to trace, you know, they didn't know how to contact trace very well because they didn't know how the disease was spread. Um, so, I, I thought it was pretty interesting in the quarantine, physical quarantine, putting up bob wire and fences all around Chinatown, the blocks made of Chinatown. It's interesting, there's a, there's a comment that says it's not a straight line on the streets, there's actually a bar out. You know, like have a street on DuPont or wherever right. it is. Yeah. And then there's suddenly this little dip and then the red line goes that way again. You say, well, what was that about? Well, there was an American store or a non-Chinese store right there. So they were excluded from the quarantine. Right. Another interesting thing is I thought was fascinating was that there's a, a bit of talk about the six companies right. and the idea, uh, uh, the idea that they uh, pointed all this out and brought a civil suit against these right. people and one saying that this is evidence of prejudice, right? 14th right. Amendment and this mm -hmm. is a very uh, 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 clear case of discrimination, right? I'm pretty fishy evidence that this right. happened. But what was interesting yeah. also is that the six companies of the Chinese themselves hid some of the people that were affected from bubonic plague because they themselves didn't want the negative publicity or the right. reinforcement. Right. Yeah. Because there's, you know, Ch Chinese were already designated as at the it, you know, the Asiatic menace, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so there there it's always a double-edged sword, mm -hmm. you know, when you they didn't want uh Many of the case, they didn't want the numbers to be high because then it would then reinforce the the idea that they were a menace and that the um, the heavy-handed treatment would come down upon. Because quarantining the second quarantine of Chinatown was sixteen days, and so what do you do about food? What do you do? about, you know, oh, people could not go to work because many people work, in fact, had to, they worked outside of China. They, they were the service industry, essentially, of the city. You know, they uh, were the gardeners, so they provided the fresh foods for hotels and families. They were the nannies, they were the cooks, you know, and all of that was cut off. In fact, the, what was significant, Interesting is when the first quarantine came into place, the white community actually threw up their hands calling Chinatown. The phone lines were flooded because they were saying, where's my cook? Where's my vegetable? The hotel hotels couldn't serve breakfast because they didn't have the eggs, you know. So it, it's always this double itch, you know, situation where do you, how, how how do you protect yourself from false accusation and real threat? And um, it's interesting, really, at the time, too, they were very directly quarantining a people versus a people in a particular geographic area or just the geographic area itself. Yeah. 
it's it's oh it's always about people rather than the disease. Mm -hmm. Trying to <clears throat> we identify, you know, they they really couldn't contact trace. They didn't know yeah. because they didn't know how the it was known that rats was related to the disease, but they didn't know how. Well, how how well the rat has how 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 does the transmission happen? And it was only later that it was understood that it was the flea on the rat that when the flea injects a rat with the disease, the rat dies and it looks for the next warm body. And of course, Chinatown being a overcrowded, dense, um, sanitary codes were not up to speed. Uh, sewer pipes were broken and, and unfixed. So obviously, you know, it it has the reputation of being dirty. Well, it's dirty partly because of the failed upkeep, maintenance of it. And so on the one hand, it's natural, may seem natural that there will be more cases there because of um, the number of rats and the, and the bees. And At the time of the story, you really feel like it's such the perfect storm of so many things. The anti-Chinese sentiment that came up through the 70s and 80s, the just unknown science of how germs are spread. Right. Um, yeah. it, it was really kind of a mystery. Um, you know, so I, I was really cognizant of trying to sell, tell the story like we're solving a medical mystery. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we um, that's why we deployed the use of the map mm -hmm. showing where all the cases were periodically coming up. So you feel the pressure of, well, is it spread? And that idea of, well, is it spread? Is it going to go beyond Chinatown? And if it does go beyond, is it going to kind of someone carry it and takes a train to Chicago and along the way spread it? So the pressure and the idea of that any day now it might explode was really actually quite real. And the federal doctors were, were keenly aware of it. And so that was the pressure on them. But the local official were very much, well, we can't say there's plague because it will decimate our economy. So there was very much that in play. And there was also the political play of who has the authority? Is it the federal side or state side? And that's something that we, we're still confronting today, this, this federal versus state, right. you know, who has control, who has authority. It seems like the political aspects of it are one of the real parallels to today, where, you know, you get the sense that if you have a uh, seemingly unsolvable problem, mm -hmm. social, medical, uh, pandemic, um, that you need you need someone politically to blame to try to buffer the impact of it politically. It also seems that um, you know the, the smallpox epidemic of eighteen sixty eight is when, according to, to a lot of historians, Chinese Americans were associated with disease, and so that grew and kind of festered until the nineteen hundred bubonic plague. So it was already existing. Um, but I, that was a question that led me to a question that I wanted to ask you about Kenyon, because it seemed like Kenyon believed that it was the Chinese who were the infected people, right? Like for all of his merits and um, wonderful innovations, um, would you say that he perpetuated the yellow peril stereotype a little bit? Or um, I mean, he certainly, I, I think, you know, ascribed to that idea, which was the idea at the time because they didn't know, you know, he he had the signs to diagnose cases as, you know, bubonic case, um, bubonic plague. 
and he was waving the red flag saying, it is here, you cannot say it doesn't exist. So very much so, but he was also under the notion that it was affecting Chinese only. Um, and, and it was later on when uh, Uber Blue came on the scene where cases begin to appear outside of, outside of Chinatown. As more cases developed, uh, affected the white population, it suddenly became, well, this is what is happening here and we need to, we need to really do something. And- um, yeah. So was it too clear, you know, Kenyon, obviously um, the, the, the difference between Kenyon and Blue, the two mm -hmm. two were stark. And it's uh, very relevant today to how much do you communicate and how much do you work with the community that is affected regardless of what the ethnicity is of the right. community. Absolutely. How do you, and that goes to your original things is there was no communication. People just right. never talked to each other. Right. And so you couldn't develop it. But I didn't get the sense from reading it uh, or watching the film what that Kenyon uh, felt it was like Chinese people that was actually the vector of this or was it? Because that didn't stop Blue from going in and trying to look right. at the other yeah. issues. And in Kenyon's case, He's a scientist who was working at the, for probably the first time to start looking at actually yeah. uh, microscopes and things yeah. of this sort to well, identify plays. Yeah, he <laughs> he is he was a brilliant scientist, like our leading bacteriologist yes. at the time. And but he was stationed on Angel Island, mm -hmm. which is, you know, back then a 45 minute ferry ride, and then I don't know how much longer before you can get into Chinatown. Um, and he was, he met a lot of pushback, like from the get go. No one wanted to believe him. No one wanted to believe that they existed, you know, for their own individual reasons. Mm -hmm. And so, so he was fighting against that. And also he, you know, followed the ideas then that it was, it was a Asian disease. Yeah. Oh. It's interesting that when Blue comes in, he takes an almost opposite view, right. takes yeah. in a Chinese translator right. with him, right. goes right. among the people in Chinatown and right. places. And you then, one of the key uh, key takeaways from that incident, what you should do today, <laughs> is right. get the trust of those people that are Absolutely. respected. And, yeah. you, and it turns around the Chinese press and everybody else that says, let's help, uh, right. let's work with the feds, right? right. Something that's and he paid yeah. his Chinese workers as much as he paid his white workers. Mm -hmm. right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it really was, you know, he, he was someone who maybe because he is not as brilliant and he was also, his background was like, he was always striving to, you know, be the equal of a uh, brilliant, uh, actually his older brother was a naval admiral or, you know, just adored by everybody. So he always felt like he had to do a cat, catch up. And he just wasn't sort of quite as brilliant as Kenyon was. So he, he was more open to other methods and which in fact was what was needed. He, he, he understood that, well, if it is happening here, I need to find out. So he went into the community and, you know, was very interesting. We were on the panel with the Chinese hospital in San Francisco, and um, which was the, their, their precursor was Dongba Dispensary, which was a dispensary that opened in Chinatown, uh, they saw their first patient in March, 1900. So it didn't quite open early enough for the first case, uh, Wan Chuck King, who, who, who died in, in, in February. But here again is a case where the Chinese community had to pay a hospital tax of $10, but could not access the the, look, the the service health service, so they lobbied over and over to establish their own hospital, but was denied permission by the city, 
And finally, in 1900, you know, April, March, they were able to open this facility. And um, $10 must have been mm -hmm. the equivalent of a few hundred dollars. That, that was quite, quite a sum mm -hmm. for an, an individual to pay and then deny access. Um, so someone asks, uh, just wondering what happened to Wong, the interpreter? Um, you know, it was very difficult trying to, uh, <clears throat> to first of all, trace, you know, and, and find out more. And, you know, there's trying to do this film during lockdown was a, a challenge because there are archives that, that we couldn't access. You know, what I would have loved to do is gone into San Bruno now to see if there was a file on Wang Chung and try to find out more about his, his personal. He was um, a uh, active member of the Sixth Company, he was secretary, and he, there was in fact a case uh, in at the end of uh, December of 19, 1900, where Kenyon, part of Kenyon's job as the um, officer was to inspect all the ships that come into San Francisco to make sure they they do not carry disease. And so, if there was a suspicion, he would have to fumigate all the luggages, inspect the, the, the passengers, and he docked all the Chinese goods that was coming in. So trade in Chinatown came to a halt. And so Wang Chung actually represented many of the merchants and sued Kenyon to release their goods. You know, Yet another parallel yeah. to today. Yeah. So, so he was quite an interesting character. I, I wish, you know, there was, we can find out more about what happened to him. Yeah. So you alluded a little to some of your research. So during the pandemic, were you relegated to strictly online things that you could find? Pretty, pretty much. I mean, we were fortunate in, in that there were a lot of prior research done. <laughs> that we were able to draw on, but certain specifics that you wish you could have first-hand mm -hmm. you know, information, um, first-hand information to, to read and, and find out about was, was difficult. So were there any organizations or institutions that were really helpful well, to you during the process? The San Francisco Public Library was actually the only one that uh, were were open to us. Later on, Berkeley, you know, had we had a couple days there, mm -hmm. but it was already later on in our filming process. And and San Francisco Public Library was very cooperative. You know, we were had limited, limited but frequent access. You know, four hours here and there, and we were able to to kind of gather our, our research and then they opened up their archive for us to film, which was incredible. So are, are there uh, aspects of the story that uh, were that made it to the editing, uh, the, I guess were cut to the editing floor that you wish you could have included? Um, there was many aspects that, you know, we, um, I think in, in general, most of it got in, but maybe, in lesser detail than I would have liked, but then, you know, who would want to watch a three, four hour documentary? So, yeah. so it was good to, good that there was a limitation. <laughs> so was there, was there uh, things going on in parallel on the East Coast at this time? With um, the Chinese, you know, the smaller numbers of Chinese that were on the- Ivanic plague, not that, not that- Or we even just the, the fear mongering yeah. I think that I think that was going on even from you know so once the exclusion act was passed mm -hmm. you know and Ted know this well we went through a decade of the most violent decade 
that was perpetrated against Chinese, all communities. Um, there were raids, there were drive outs, you know, there was a famous Boston raid um, in, I think it was 1903, where 300, I, I think something like 240 people were just arrested and pulled in. And then people then had to bring out their identification card, you know, because of the Geary Act and you didn't have it. In fact, you know, I don't remember the numbers now, a number of people were deported because they couldn't produce and couldn't get white friends to come and vouch for them. So that, that kind of um, um, pressure on the community it has been ongoing. You know, must have had an impact on the, say, legislature. Because you have the 1882 Act, of course, and it's renewed every 10 years. Right. And so, but in 1903, you make it, it becomes permanent. Yeah. And so this is right at the time when this bubonic plague is going on. So the legislature, the people who are in Congress mm -hmm. are probably very cognizant of this, right? The, 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 the continuation of the stereotypes or that it's an Asian issue, dirty Chinese or whatever, those things perpetuate and become manifested right. in a permanent making of the, mm -hmm. of the Chinese exclusion laws permanently. Yeah, yeah, fair. Yeah, this, this medical, Asiatic medical menace, you know, those, those three words just, you know, I, 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 I cringe when I read it and when I have to say it, but it is a code. It's a very coded language, you know, that uh, uh, very much just, you know, very clearly saying they are the other, they are unworthy, they are undeserving, they are, you know, all these things down the line, which makes it very easy for you to say, well, if they're unworthy, we can very easily, you know, just, do violence, mm -hmm. uh, enact laws that just exclude them. They're excluded already, but it's not enough, and we have to, you know, pile it on. Um, and, and and that language, you know, they're unassimilable. That's language that is we hear more recently as well. It's it's just when you and it's 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 used, you know, when you other it's. It, it 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 just allows <coughs> because it dehumanizes you and once that happens it just seems like it's so much easier to perpetrate you know acts of violence against a community and it's not the othering place takes place not just with chinese american asian american and all people of color. And um, I think one of the takeaway lessons that I, I get from this, in the end, when San Francisco was in fact successful in stemming cases was when all, all the communities across the board came together to work together. And I, I think that's also a, a great lesson for us to learn today, you know, that only when we work across communities can we really, um, you know, stem the tide of racism and, and other issues. You know, John A. Powell, who's in our film, has this wonderful phrase about um, the, the, I'm going to get it wrong, and apologies to John Powell. Uh, uh, oh gosh, how did he? Uh, circle of of circle of and circle of humanity, or or um, and it is this idea that if you're within the circle, you're cared for, and if you're not, you know. So so othering comes to to play in there when when you're other, you're outside of that circle. And so a lot of the inequity, whether it's in health or economic 
inequity we see is because people are not embraced within that circle. You know, it's really interesting just to bring it back to some of the stuff that I, I did during the immigrant, my immigration stuff is that uh, we always thought uh, there was there's always a policy if you're not a citizen we're not going to give you any services right so you take away the services for uh, uh, a school but which can't do that because of the amendment that requires you to provide public education to anyone is there but I always used to use argument you can't you can't not allow uh, people regardless of their citizenship or their uh, status to not access public health benefits, right? So, but if you have a policy, whether local, local or federal, that says if you don't, you are subject to deportation because you can't present a green card or something like this, or you can create a fear of people not going to the clinic, then they're not going to go. And so the thing is, you create either some flu or some disease or a bubonic plague, it doesn't show up until it's too late. So that 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 is such a, uh, 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 the othering or not including them in the circle creates more problems for the people that are creating the laws, right? So how do you discover, uh, in those days, we were talking about SARS and things of this sort, right? And it was a very real problem. It could be happening now. Same thing with the bubonic plate in San Francisco during that time, where they were hiding the bodies, right? Uh, that uh, so that they they couldn't be seen as a continuing disease. Yeah, so they have real it, impact. Yeah, it, it's a you know back then it was also a cultural thing. You know, the the idea of uh, uh, cutting up the body after death. Okay. Autopsy was anathema. You know, you, the body needs to be whole because the belief of the afterlife and so forth. And you know, the Western doctors had no conception of that. So there's always this misunderstanding and disjunction. So there was the there was no because there's no understanding. There's no not showing the respect and, and perhaps saying, oh, we need to do this because of certain issue and we will be respectful. We will just do a small incision at this certain part of the body and, and not, you know, so that it, it, it is understood that it is done with respect. Uh, when that doesn't happen, you know, the fear of, oh, you know, my relative will be wandering in the afterlife because it, you know, they were not well treated uh, because the body was cut or, or, or also um, cremated. So um, there were there were a lot of these misunderstandings that caused the community to to hide. Um, from the gallery, someone asks uh, if Juho versus Williamson was the first lawsuit against gerrymandering. Does that sound? Uh, interesting question. Um, I don't know. I don't know. But but Juho versus Williamson is the quarantine case where the lines were zigzag, as as uh, Ted was saying. And you know, uh, the Chinese brought two cases all the way to the Ninth Circuit Court. <laughs> Someone asked, why isn't this information in our textbooks? I mean, I think that question also expands to a lot of uh, Chinese American history, but uh, you know, it makes me think, you know, if you could imagine the 20th century with this history clearly written and told and understood, you know, could we have changed think of the way uh, you know this more, more recent pandemic played out? You know, but would it would people have learned some more vital lessons from? You know, it, I don't. You know, I, I don't really. There is this tension between the uh, commercial interests versus the uh, <laughs> public health interests. That's very clear. We can see this, but I don't see the political thing that is prevalent in this current thing where the current thing, you don't trust scientists because it's a reflection of an ideological hatred of you know your 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 own 
bits of zombieism. I don't see that in what you have seen. In the, no, in the, I, I think I think the Chinese mistrust was at the time because you know the science wasn't quite there yet. Mm -hmm. You know the vaccination was experimental. You know fifty percent. You know um, uh, efficacy uh, and vaccination at the time was still relatively you know, new to people. So to come in to mandate everyone in Chinatown must be vaccinated was just, just something that people didn't understand why. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you're at the beginnings of microbiology. Right. You know, but in this yeah. case, vaccination wouldn't have made the difference, right, for the chronic plague, was it? It was yeah. the it, it was like eliminating the vector that caused the disease, right? right? Whether it's mosquito. And interestingly, Blue went on to talk about how to eradicate malaria. Right. Because yeah. of the same get rid of the vector that's right. the mosquitoes. Yeah. And so, so so that that yeah. became understood because once once it once it became clear and understood, it's the fleas on the rats. So then we have to kill the the rats to finally then contain. Um, the, the, the spread because you know the rats they are kind of everywhere as we all know you know mm -hmm. live, live, living in New York certainly you know you see rats everywhere and mm -hmm. um, and and to answer the question about curriculum um, it seems like since the COVID pandemic, more states are incorporating Asian American history into their curriculum, I, I, especially New Jersey, which is where I grew up. I didn't learn about Asian American history until I minored in Asian American studies in college. So it was, you know, nowhere to be seen until I was in college. But now it seems like there's more to be done, which leads me to a question, um, you know, since 2020, anti-Asian hate crime has risen a, a lot, right? So in 2021, it rose over 300%. And then since 2021, it's risen 77%. Um, how was it direct, writing and directing this film during a time where there was just increasing anti-Asian hate crimes everywhere in Midland, Texas and Brooklyn and San Francisco, um, culminating in Atlanta and you know, another murder in New York this past year? Um, how, yeah. how did it feel writing about this happening historically in your present moment? Yeah, it, it, it really is, um, it, uh, which we, we talked about it earlier a little bit, is, you know, how, how, how to tell this story so that people um, understand that, you know, it, today's situation, we are not, uh, uh, that there is a history to it, in fact, um, that doesn't justify it, it doesn't, um, it comforts not the right word, but I, I think when you, when you see a pattern, you know, kind of what we were talking about, uh, the political pattern, the, uh, uh, the health denying, denial pattern, the science denying pattern, that you, you see that pattern and you also see the resistance to it, um, that I find that it, it gives me a slimmer of hope. You know, your question of if we had known this history, will we not have repeated it? I, I, I don't know, you know. Uh, human nature is such that you're faced with an unknown fear. You, you, you don't know what to do. You don't know the answer. So you just go, well, must be them, you know. Um, that, that is, we've seen that across diseases, right? The AIDS pandemic, uh, it was, oh no, it's, it's, their problem, it's the homosexual problem. And it's not until we started working with the community that we were able to begin to come up with solutions and, 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 and answers. You know, uh, it didn't quite answer your, your question, but I, I think um, for, for me it is to just dig deep into the history 
to tell that story so that you maybe can take lessons from it or take um, uh, just uh, in terms of, well, okay, it's been happening. So it's not just us now. Um, so then the next question is, well, what do you do then? You know, how do you act? And you can also take lessons from the past. The community is always where uh, you can find security and safety within your community. And it is when the community come together and fight back that you know we can make headways. So um, to me, the lesson is always how do we learn? What do we learn? And to reflect also individually, because we all have preconceptions and misconceptions, right? It's not, not just, uh, you know, Chinese Americans, we have our uh, misconception, pre, uh, you know, biases. And so we need to all reflect in words and, and, and work across community to, um, you know, some of the some of really didn't mean not totally you know. but the question of education and of course it's the idea of fact finding and then doing it in an objective way so that we have those things there that we can tell the story. I don't know if it is a question of do we learn that one of the takeaways is to fight back because in you see in some of the um, in that pandemic you have like uh, in Kintu, who is a very influential editor, editor. Uh, and he's arguing that what you are describing is just pure anti-Chinese ra racism. Right. But it's not really in the sense that that actually would actually inhibit the public the public health people from actually going in and figuring out where all the things are. But the, the idea still is to find the uh, stories and make sure this, this the, the, they are told factually, right? Absolutely. And then the other thing, though, is going back to how do you get it into the school curriculum, right? So we had talked about before. I'm not sure if anybody want to see a two-hour film on, on, um, on any particular topic uh, about rats and stuff. But, and this is where maybe Susan Chinson can talk about the Asian experience and the project that we're trying to do. How many people actually have saw have seen the film, the uh, two hour film? It's an hour. It's an hour and a half running time. No, it's it's actually uh, our hour fifty one. Hour fifty one, almost two hour running time. Fascinating. I didn't think it's in very long. But <laughs> but the thing to do is if you look at the little excerpts, those things are really fun to watch, and they're only like six minutes snippets. And for younger and for younger, younger audience, younger audience or other audience. So you're thinking about how do you teach? How do you get this stuff into curriculum, both for any levels, but particularly for the younger levels? And this is where some of the American Experience uh, project makes a difference, where you can take these things and put them into a curriculum so that people can learn about it uh, uh, and be receptive. So it doesn't have to be everything in one go, right? Yeah. Curriculum. Actually, my ten-year-old watched um, some of your films. Oh. He said, "This is this is terrible." Um, like you know, like he wanted to thirsty to learn about this image. Um, that's mm -hmm. great because then you can open up conversations. Mm -hmm. fact, someone from the gallery asks, uh, "What do we know about the lawyers who brought these cases uh, for work?" Um, um, the it's lawyers who took most of the cases. And and let me can I just add. If anyone in the audience, live audience, has a question, just feel free to raise your hand. Yeah, you know, the Chinese community really were savvy in that they hired sort of the, the most, the, the best white lawyers to represent them. You know, for example, Wang Chung is bilingual, so they have community members who spoke English and worked with the Chinese lawyer. In fact, the lawyer of one of the, uh, I think for both cases, one of the lawyer 
was a former judge who uh, sat on the case of uh, Mamie Tate, mm -hmm. the Mamie, the educational case uh, in San Francisco where um, you know, a Chinese parent wanted their daughter to go to the public school but was denied access and uh, fought and won the case. And the judge who, you know, again, 14th Amendment, equal protection, um, maybe won the case, uh, that judge actually became one of the lawyers in the 1900s, uh, the, the, the Juho versus Williamson case. So I think Ted and I always talk about having a program that just focuses on all these landmark cases because yeah. they really, uh, they really changed a lot of playing fields, made really great big impacts in, in, a, in a lot of areas. So mm -hmm. some of them are really the nice. case won the case, they yeah. still weren't able to send Mamie to school. Well, you know what, it, what, what it was, was that uh, Plessy versus Ferguson was still yeah. very, was reaffirmed. So you have a separate but equal. Mm -hmm. And the question for the case in California, the Amy Tate case, there was no Chinese school to go into China. And that actually established the first uh, Chinese, uh, one of the first Chinese schools right. in San Francisco. Uh, what, it's still, what is it? Anyway, th yeah. that's there. But the, um, uh, one of the interesting things is the, uh, the, the more you learn about these cases and things that are going on, you begin to realize that the six companies, this traditional, traditional organizations, which many of the time when I was studying civil uh, Asian American studies, kind of poo poo the, the, the six companies because they're traditional, right? right? They still fraternal organizations and other sorts of like, but it's quite clear that they were behind uh, the, the hiring and the bringing on of the lawyers that can argue the cases. Uh, but uh, uh, so I, I've always thought that it's worthwhile to do another study and think about the uh, six companies uh, being much more significant in Chinese American history than they are given credit for. Because they, uh, what comes up here is, is that they are basically a Chinese organization trying to just make their way in, in, in the, the U.S., maybe gathering funds for the revolution in China or something of this sort. But uh, and maintaining a lot of traditions, which people. But they were very key to a lot of those uh, very much, those cases. Yeah, yeah. yeah, very much. Is mem members of the Chinese Six Company oftentimes are the kind of the influential members in the community of their their family association or or merchants. You know, so they're very very tied into the community and. Naturally, the welfare of the community is their concern because that's their base. And uh, they were, in, in fact, um, I'm in, in the middle of reading Mei Nai's new book, The Chinese Question. She touched upon mm -hmm. this issue a lot where they were pretty quite savvy in terms of knowing, well, we know we can't get everything. So what is the best thing we can negotiate for, you know, even like, um, during the, the gold rush, the foreign miners tax, you know, they were able to sort of maneuver in it, into a situation where the local governments would benefit from the tax, you know, but titrated to, to a degree so that it was manageable for the Chinese, but also profitable for, you know, but you know, the as as much as there is a study there, the Chinese Six Companies was not as we think of it, as a civil rights organization, right? So then, so the Amy Tate case or the other case that is in Mississippi, which is called Wong, uh, Wong Lum versus Rice, they didn't really they used the Fourteenth Amendment, but not to the extent that it would include others, right? And they didn't go to the other step to say we demand citizenship for everyone. That's not what they're, they just want to protect some. In fact, the Chinese American Citizen Alliance, the one that we talked about that I belong to, they were formed as the native sons of the Golden State, I went there soon. But one of their provisions was that they would, uh, you had to be born in the United States, you had to be American citizen. So at that time, 
you had Chinese Exclusion Act prohibiting you from becoming naturalized. They took a lot of, of uh, criticism from the from the six companies, traditional organizations, who said, you guys are becoming Americans, you're losing your Chinese. So there was a big separation in the direction that these people were. Yeah, I think that's that's sort of uh, still an issue in in you know with the more recent immigrants. It's like, do you assimilate, you know, and and how do you how do you, and how do you then still hold on to your culture and tradition? That that plays out today as well. So, Lisha, if you, if you were to have one legacy that you can envision for your film, what would that be? You know, what would you like the outcome of your, obviously you produced a great film, that's an outcome, but uh, you know, the, uh, the, the how, how do you hope that people use your film? Um, I think it's sort of what I was saying earlier is that, um, I think history can teach us and can can help us understand what we are going through today. And very much the idea that, you know, um, to when even even when you learn about history that is prejudicial against you or your group, um, to to also learn from that and reflect, you know, the idea that we need to, in fact, all work together. It's, you know, we need to expand that circle to embrace more and more people. And that uh, to, to self-reflect and reach across, across your comfort zone um, is, I think, you know, where we will have hope to we probably will never eradicate racism, but to improve the situation. Right. Are there any questions? Yeah. So much for this lovely film. I remember during the pandemic, uh, whenever there, uh, especially when there was shooting at Atlanta, Georgia, anti-Asian hate crime. Um, one of the things that um, I felt was really helpless, I felt really hopeless. And then I bought a $200 rice cooker. So I was mm -hmm. like, I'm not going to let these terrorists make me um, feel this kind of Asian. So I'm wondering um, if I could get some balance about that they can give you hope for a better future for our people. Yeah, I think for me, you know, I, I as you may be repeating myself, I, I look to history. You know, that's my, my whole career has been in historical documentary and I, I I find that you know when I hear that this has been happening across time um, on the one hand it's depressing because it continues to happen but also uh, on the other hand you you find resilience within the community and and that that is what gives me hope you know we 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 all belong we all, you know, have have shared this the same same community, and we we need to come together to to improve it however we can. Uh, a number of people have asked either they want to rewatch the film or I guess share it with someone else. Uh, will this continue to be available through PBS? Yes, or? it will continue to be available. Uh, through I think 20, uh, 2025, you can stream free on PBS. So, and um, there is a Chinese subtitle version available as well for those in the, in the community that, you know, English is difficult. Um, and a Spanish can, version. And a Spanish version, so. Sorry, what's the title of the film? Plague at the Golden Gate. Yes. And on PBS. On PBS. Yeah. And is it playing in the right places? No, uh, just on PBS online. So you can you can uh, if you go to pbs.org, uh, look up 
like at the Golden Gate, and you know, it will direct you to a site where you can you can see this logo, uh, and it will probably have a button that say play the play the film, and you press on that. You also, if you registered for either the online version of this event or the live uh, attendance, we'll, we will follow up with all of our attendees with uh, links and uh, goodies. I'm, I'm actually just to follow up with um, women in events my question I'm curious to hear from David and Ted too about what you did to respond to the anti Asian hate crimes in the last few years. Well, you know. I, I can only speak for the museum you know we're, we're not really an advocacy organization we're not really built as an advocacy organization, but I think we approach it as a museum as. knowledge and information and, and telling people this history, it's kind of an important weapon in, you know, that, that advocacy for, uh, you know, changing hearts and minds and uh, addressing hate and, and violence. Yeah, we're in a sort of similar mode in the sense that we're his, history oriented, right? But we, uh, uh, the, uh, so we're slightly different from civil rights organizations, CA or more but that we still advocate. And one of the things is that if we had, if we can find a historical topic, like the page app, and what we would do, and we did, we have a, a seminar, which uh, of, of talk story presentation, page app through line to Atlanta. And what we would do is then have a talk about the page act. And that page act was, uh, was one of the first exclusion laws that particularly targeted women. Uh, and the uh, Chinese Chinese women particularly. Uh, so uh, so we took that law and explained the history of that law and the various prejudices, stereotypes that came out. That's where you begin to have that the Chinese women were adult, uh, subservient and uh, were there. They were basically sort of like slaves in the families and things like that. More anxiety sort. So then you uh, then we had the panel like this that talked about how that prejudice continued through and is manifested in the Atlanta killing, right? So we had that kind of discussion. The other thing is, and I, that I, I'm I'm setting this up to lead into <laughs> Audrey's new book, which is going to be about masculine uh, stereotypes in our literature, and that's one of the key things to think about. We are involved in things that are trying to change or symbolically have things represent and the image that we want. So one thing that I would add, we, we promote quite a lot when we do fairs and we pass out things is uh, uh, Committee 100 has a thing called the uh, Yellow Whistle Campaign. And so if uh, what that does is literally a yellow whistle with a car. And so the idea is during the uh, anti-Asian hate uh, movements, you see a lot of people just attacking women on this, particularly Chinese American women on the streets. Um, and so push them over and things of this sort. And if you had some kind of a whistle that will help alert the people around them, it's not going to prevent that prejudice from happening or occurring, but it might help a little bit. And then the, but importantly, the whistle itself is a sort of symbolic representation that you're not going to be quiet, that you're going to continue to do things. And you use the yellow, which has a two, two, two significant colors, right? I mean, the color has two significance. One is that you're afraid, right? But if you flip that over and you say yellow, that's my color, I'm gonna be proud. So this is the type of things that we get involved in. But more important is exactly what we've been talking about. How do we in our education make sure that the image of the Chinese American is as an individual who is worthwhile on his own? part of America, part of, and on your own, whether you belong to America or not, you're worthwhile. And so in the literature area, that's where you really want to look at how do we write to make sure that people have that right impression and the right, right history, the right impression and the way that we express it. And that's Audrey's. Audrey's going to have this great book. It's going to be well, called, let's tell about it. So, well, the, the book that you refer to called Players is coming out next year, and it's about um, Asian American masculinity in response to major war, major wars after World War II. So the, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, 
Gulf War and War on Terror. Um, and my argument is that um, they were taking on this kind of um, American imperialist persona in their everyday lives as appears in literature. Um, but my third book project, which is what I really dove into during the pandemic, um, is on this period that David describes as one of the most violent um, anti-Asian periods in history in the 1870s and 1880s, which is what I call the lynching period, um, in which there were literal lynchings of Chinese Americans um, in the 1880s, um, as we should pointed out, they, they were driven out of West Coast cities, um, they continued to be lynched. Um, and this is also the period in which the first Asian American writers, Chinese American specifically writers, were published. Um, and so I contextualized the first Asian American literature within this really violent period. Um, and I think for me, it was really cathartic to be writing about it because it helped me kind of make sense of what was happening around me. Um, but also I kind of understood these writers better of trying to be productive during a period and that was really against people like me, right? Um, and so I think that um, also I surrounded myself with people who were supportive. Um, and I joined um, Stop Anti-Asian uh, anti hate, um, hate group, um, Groups and um, reconnected with people I grew up with and um, on my campus, I help run um, an Asian Pacific American Wellness Alliance, and we would have check-ins with each other, especially during these times for it was just rampant anti-Asian hate during, in this country. Um, and it was really helpful just to be there for each other, to talk through how we were doing, um, talk about why these things were happening and why they happened in the past, why they continue to happen. Um, and so I think that that was really helpful in dealing with what was going around it. I think I think you ought to be optimistic, actually, because uh, I, I was dealing with Asian American literature in the '60s and '50s, right even before the Asian American Studies be a thing, right? But the number of writers, the variety of writers and authors that are now coming up, is fantastic in terms of film producers, uh, creative films or documentary films. But the variety of, of uh, literature that is being written, not just Chinese, but also uh, other nationalities, Vietnamese or so, uh, Vietnamese, Chinese or Chinese, Vietnamese, all this stuff is yeah. coming up yeah. and Japanese and yeah. oh, is coming up and the perspectives and ideas are so varied, right? So I think, um, not to mention all the TV actors and actresses who are coming out and, and not just the riches, crazy riches. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> but anyway, I think so. I think that at this time, you know, for me, and if I compare what it was when I was a student at your at your age and what is available today, I would say there is you should be optimistic of all of the variety of topics and the talent that is there, right? Representation. The representation of like, yeah. yeah just to add to that, I was really delighted to see the, uh, the credit that was given to this film. That the major act, I mean, major people that contributed to the film were all Asian, mm -hmm. you know, and, and all across, it's not only Chinese, mm -hmm. Japanese, Americans, Vietnamese, and Korean. Koreans, you know, yeah. and Filipino, yeah. you know, so, so it's all Asian. It, that, they were uh, working on the film. That was quite, I know that was quite general. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I think we've run out of time. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'd like to thank Audrey and uh, Li Shen and Ted and also uh, Louisa Sorkness and Tessa and Xin and uh, all the people that make this, these programs happen. And uh, I think let me uh, share this here. Um, so as I mentioned, um, everybody that registered for this event will will follow up with an email and it should have links to, uh, if you're having trouble with the, some people reporting they were having trouble with the PBS link. So we'll, we'll test it out and make sure you have what you need. So well, thank you everybody.